Good morning and welcome to the RTC Pickle or Training Center on Promoting Interventions for Community Living State of the Science Virtual Conference. Um, my name is Catherine Ibsen and I am getting the dubious honor of um, starting and kicking off this three day webinar series. So um, I just want to highlight as we get started that the virtual conference is funded through a grant from NIDLER, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehab Research. Before we get on with today's activities, I just want to go over a few housekeeping uh, features, accessibility features, and so forth. Um, first, automated captioning is available on today's call, and you can turn on captioning by clicking on the CC Live transcript uh, button in the Zoom toolbar. Um, you'll see show subtitles, which turns on the captions. And in that same location, you can adjust the size of the captions to meet your needs by selecting subtitle settings. We have sign language interpreters for the webinar today, Jolene Benham and Hannah Rudolph. Um, we are using a gallery view in Zoom so that you can see both the shared screen and interpreter. If you only see the shared screen, Go to the top of your Zoom window and move your cursor on the green bar at the top that reads View Options and click on the arrow and make sure that you are in side by side mode. <clears throat> we are going to have questions and answers at the end of the presentations today and Kelsey Goddard is going to be moderating those questions. We will answer questions in the order they come in, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So to ask a question, we ask that you use the question and answer button, button at the bottom of the screen. If you have trouble accessing the question and answer box, you can use the raise hand feature. And uh, when it's time for questions, Kelsey will call on you and unmute your line so you can ask your question. Um, if you're joining by telephone, you can also press star nine to raise your hand. Um, we ask that you do not use the chat feature to ask questions to presenters. So with those details out of the way, I wanna uh, kick off the state of the science on community participation and give you just a brief overview of where we're coming from um, on the topic of community participation and then introduce our speakers for today. So uh, community participation is very important to our overall well-being and quality of life. It makes us feel valued and connected and I think all of us feel um, a little bit in tune with this feeling of community community participation more from a loss aspect due to covid we are all coping with kind of some change changing ways in which we engage with one another lack of social connections is associated with negative physical and mental health outcomes um, it's associated with higher odds of physician visits, hospital admissions, hospital readmissions, depression, poor cardiovascular health, cognitive declines, and the list goes on. Um, that said, each of us has very desired for social connection and we aren't, we aren't the same as the next person sitting next to us. Um, some of us want a lot of social connection all the time, some not so much, but we all deserve the opportunity to participate in ways that meet our needs and preferences. And so really community participation is shaped by opportunity. It's the essential ingredient of participating. And unfortunately, opportunity is not shared equally across the population. Now, opportunity is shaped by structural, environmental, and socio-demographic factors. And 
the impact of these factors is really highlighted in the social model of disability, where the intersection of personal and environmental factors shape some of these opportunity aspects and per community participation in this regard becomes the gold standard of research outcomes. With that small overview, um, I'm just going to go over quickly the SOS conference agenda. Um, we have gathered together leaders in the field of community participation research to highlight different aspects of community participation and ways to enhance that. It's a three webinar series. Today, we're really setting the stage for understanding community participation. It will be followed by factors influencing community participation and then applying lessons learned to increase community participation. So those are the topics across the three webinar series and we are in day one. Um, it is a diverse agenda representing multiple aspects of opportunity. Um, and opportunity can be shaped by early intervention, assistive technology, home usability, transportation, fall detection, online community building. And so we're gonna hit on these types of topics to really get a better handle of the outcome of community participation and the factors that can enhance or um, undermine it. So how did we uh, pick our conference speakers? So there were two initiatives that were funded under the RTC Pickle. And, <clears throat> excuse me, leading off um, the, the research at the Pickle was a systematic review conducted by the American Institutes for Research Campbell Collaboration. And they did a systematic review of literature between the year 2000 and 2016 to really set the stage of understanding and to use as the liftoff for the center. Um, that systematic review looked at interventions in community seven settings that address two or more individual or environmental factors to community participation. And to give you an idea of the scope of this review, uh, they reviewed 4,734 articles for inclusion, of which 15 were selected based on inclusion criteria and rigor. And I want to highlight that two of the presenters today were included in that um, final 15 articles selected, Dr. Gilbert Gim and uh, Dr. Joy Hamill. Additionally, <clears throat> The uh, Pickle sponsored a, um, a special, uh, specifically an SOS or State of the Science um, Disability and Health Journal online supplement regarding community participation. And uh, the other two speakers today, Lily Griman and Dr. Jean Hall, will be talking about their research that was um, covered in that online supplement. And just a, kind of a quick shout out, that should be hitting the, the um, community very soon. So look out for that um, special, special supplement. Okay, so I get to start um, with my presentation of our speakers. So Dr. Gilbert Gim is our first speaker today, and he's gonna describe findings from the National Demonstration to Maintain Independence and Employment Evaluation. So Dr. Gim currently serves as the Associate Professor of Health Administration and Policy at George Mason University. Um, he's also served as a senior researcher at Mathematica Policy Research, where he conducted program evaluation for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. His research interests focus on access to care for adults with disabilities, Medicaid policy evaluations, and Medicare payment reforms. So not only is Gilbert a accomplished economist and researcher, but he's an all around great guy. And I've had the recent privilege to getting to know and work with him. So I'm really um, honored to be able to introduce him today. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Joy Hamill. And Dr. Hamill will present on consumer directed goal planning in the delivery of assistive technology services for people who are aging with intellectual disabilities. So Joy employs community-based participatory action research to promote participation, per, sorry, that's a lot of words, participation, choice, control, and societal opportunity with people who are aging with disabilities and with disability and aging communities. Joy identifies as a disabled person and scholar. She actively transfers research findings and knowledge back to disability and aging communities with the goal of decreasing health disparities and improving health and participation opportunities. Lily Griman. Lily is a, oh, Lily will present on the relationship between home usability and community participation for people with disabilities. So Lily's official title is Project Director for the Research and Training Center on Disability in Rural Communities, or RTC Rural, which is where um, I'm from. But she works on a number of projects with partners across the country, um, including uh, the RTC Pickle. Lily brings a passion and skill to collaborative work to improve the lives of people with disabilities in rural communities and beyond. Her research areas focus on housing, community participation, rural community development, and spatial and demographic analysis. Uh, thankfully, Lily and I have been colleagues for many years, and her inquisitiveness and willingness to learn makes her an increasingly valued researcher in the field of disability. Finally, wrapping up today's webinar will be Dr. Jean Hall, who will present on factors influencing participation for people with mobility disabilities. So Jean is the principal investigator for the Nidler funded RTC Pickle and the principal investigator on the CDC funded Kansas Disability and Health Program. She also works on the Nidler funded collaborative on health reform and independent living or CRIL, which was housed at Washington State University and has recently wrapped up. But an important aspect of the CRIL was their fielding of the National Survey on Health and Disability or NSHD. And recently that initiative has received funding to continue on. And as part of the NSHD, um, Jean can really fulfill her mission of giving a voice to people with disabilities related to health outcomes. So with this overview, I will pass the microphone on to Gil, and I just hope you enjoy the webinar today. Thanks. Great. So thank you very much, Dr. Ipsen, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, as, um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm uh, Gilbert Gim. Uh, I'm an associate professor uh, from George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, and I'm delighted uh, to be able to present today uh, on uh, the impact of early intervention programs for working adults with potentially disabling conditions, uh, evidence from the national DMIE evaluation. And the DMIE stands for the Demonstration to Maintain Independence and Employment, uh, community participation includes many different things, and in this case, uh, the focus of this study will be on uh, the importance of employment. So there are many different uh, aspects of interventions that can be used to improve community participation. Uh, later today, you'll see examples uh, in the form of assistive technology, uh, and other types of initiatives. The DMIE, the primary focus is on a policy intervention uh, to improve community participation. Uh, the DMIE was authorized by Congress uh, way back in 1999 under the Ticket to Work and Work Incentives uh, Improvement Act. And the main goal was to test whether a program, really a policy of medical assistance and wraparound supports uh, can uh, reduce uh, dependence on federal disability benefits and also help to improve or maintain health as well as employment outcomes. 
And uh, the main argument was that improved access to services uh, can enhance uh, these health outcomes and support employment uh, for those who would like to continue working. The policy was motivated by a growing uh, interest, uh, primarily by the Social Security Administration, uh, to reduce uh, or prevent disability applications. So uh, at the time in the 1990s, there was quite a backlog in uh, SSA disability applications and a sharp increase in the number of disability insurance beneficiaries, uh, otherwise known as DI beneficiaries. Um, and the early intervention uh, was a novel approach at the time. Uh, SSA uh, has looked at efforts to try to uh, encourage return to work where individuals who become DI beneficiaries uh, would later uh, leave the SSA program. Uh, but that's been quite difficult. Uh, less than 1% of DI beneficiaries in any given year will exit the rolls. So the focus of this uh, particular study, uh, and this comes from uh, publications in 2011, as well as uh, 2014, uh, were the following. Can an early intervention program of medical assistance and other supports reduce the likelihood of applications and receipt of federal disability benefits? And the short answer is yes, it can. Um, can an early intervention program improve employment retention? And the short answer was uh, no, we didn't find evidence of that in the short run. And finally, can an early intervention program improve health status? And uh, the short answer from our uh, study was yes, in one of the states uh, that we examined. So the DMIE encompassed uh, four different states that participated in a randomized control trial of working age adults with potentially disabling conditions. These findings are based on uh, results for two states, Minnesota and Texas, that had target populations of adults with severe uh, mental illness and other mental health conditions. Uh, so you can see in the case of Minnesota, their primary target population included adults with severe mental illness, and they focused their um, recruitment strategy on those with public insurance, uh, those having Minnesota care, uh, and these are low-income uh, adults who uh, did not have access to Medicaid otherwise. Uh, this population included uh, childless adults. Uh, so this was before, uh, of course, the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, authorized uh, Medicaid expansions. And in Texas, the target population also included adults with severe mental illness, but had a second group of those with uh, behavioral conditions co-occurring with a, a physical uh, impairment. And the primary target uh, population in Texas uh, was looking at the suburbs of Houston, um, and their primary focus was on a safety net program for low-income uninsured residents who are part of Harris County. Um, both populations in Minnesota and Texas included uh, working age adults, so there's a little bit of a difference. Uh, Minnesota's range was 18 to 57 years old uh, adults, and for Texas it was 20 to 60 year olds. Uh, both populations had a similar uh, eligibility inclusion criterion of uh, work in the prior month. And the other requirement was there could be no uh, active uh, applications uh, of SSA uh, disability benefits at the time of uh, recruitment. So I wanted to briefly describe the components of the DMIE uh, early intervention. Um, and it's, it's interesting, it covers uh, several different uh, important elements. Uh, the first is a set of wraparound behavioral and dental health services, uh, and in particular, uh, the introduction of expedited mental health visits uh, so that uh, participants could uh, go to uh, specific uh, resources, uh, behavioral health specialists who would otherwise uh, not be available with uh, other types of public insurance. 
Um, the second is employment supports. So there was some career counseling, uh, peer support interventions provided as part of the DMIE. Person-centered case management. So there was an initial one-on-one -on -one, uh, needs assessment and uh, that case manager would also help with uh, goal setting uh, and provide advice and suggestions on other types of uh, services that would be available. And then lastly, in the case of Minnesota, the, there was a financial subsidy to help with payments of premiums. So under the DMIE, uh, participants in Minnesota had a lower premium of only $10 uh, per month, as opposed to the uh, $392 under Minnesota Care. Um, just very briefly in terms of methods, so uh, the study was conducted uh, using uh, SSA administrative records, and that was linked to DMIE participant survey data in the two states, Minnesota and Texas. Uh, this involved uh, using the ticket research file on disability benefits that were received, as well as the 831 file, which is a, a separate record of all disability applications. Uh, the most important feature of this particular study was the use of random assignment. Um, so this was uh, 10 years ago uh, that this uh, study first came out. And uh, since then, um, I haven't seen examples of uh, large scale studies using random assignment uh, since then. Um, the virtue of random assignment is uh, it looks at uh, moving participants to one of two groups, either a treatment group that receives the intervention or a control group which receives business as usual services. And the main goal of using random assignment, which is the gold standard of research methods, is to see the effect of the intervention itself, uh, controlling for uh, all other uh, observable characteristics and potential confounders. Uh, we used an intent to treat analysis, uh, which means that participants were observed, uh, even if they uh, fell out in the middle of the uh, a demonstration, we continued to track their uh, outcomes. And lastly, we used we applied weights for survey non-response, and the impact estimates are regression adjusted, so they do control for age, demographics, uh, health status, and other observable characteristics. Um, so this just shows the distribution of the treatment and control group in Minnesota. And the main, um, our main goal was to have two groups with very similar uh, characteristics that were observable. So we find that is the case here, both the treatment and control group have similar ages, uh, the percentage that are uh, female, about 60%, uh, similar percent of those who are white and non-Hispanic uh, and those currently married. And the next slide also confirms that the random assignment worked well to produce a similar distribution of characteristics in the treatment control group in the state of Texas. And here we see the mean age is very similar, close to 47 years of age. Uh, both groups have uh, a similar proportion of uh, female uh, participants, uh, about three fourths uh, and so forth. And in terms of uh, demographic characteristics in the full sample, there are some differences between the two states. So the uh, mean age of those enrolled in uh, Texas is a little bit older at 47 years compared to Minnesota, uh, 38 years. Uh, the percent of females uh, uh, is also a little bit higher, 76% in Texas compared to uh, Minnesota. And in terms of health and employment characteristics, uh, we also see some differences between uh, the two states. In Texas, we see a lower uh, physical health, an SF12 score of 37.9 compared to Minnesota, which is 47.9. Um, to give some context for interpretation, the SF12 score has a norm-based mean of 50, which represents the national average. So in the case of Texas, the uh, uh, mean physical health score is considerably worse than the national average, whereas in Minnesota, it's very close to the national average of 50. For mental health scores, uh, the difference goes in the opposite direction. So it's lower in Minnesota at 35.1, uh, 
compared to Texas, which is at 49.6. And on this graph, um, I just summarized some of the main results. On the left side, you can see that in the two states, uh, we're looking at the percent of participants who applied for disability benefits uh, within 12 months after enrolling in the DMIE. And this shows you that the treatment group, 4.8% uh, applied for disability benefits, which was lower than the control group, uh, where 6.9% of participants applied for disability benefits. And uh, this difference is significant uh, with a p-value of 0.03. Um, so this shows that the treatment group had a lower uh, percentage uh, applying for uh, disability benefits after enrolling in uh, the DMIE. Similarly, uh, for the percent of participants receiving SSA benefits within 12 months after enrollment, in the two states, we see that the treatment group only had a 2.8% uh, receiving SSA benefits compared to 4.3% in the control group receiving SSA benefits. Uh, this difference also is significant at the 5% level. So P here is 0.04. And uh, I've also shown you that in Texas by itself, uh, we see a significant difference. The treatment group 3.1% uh, received SSA benefits within a year compared to 5.3% in the control group. Uh, the next slide just shows that there was not much change in terms of employment retention. So across the two states in the treatment group, 94% uh, uh, were uh, still employed two years after enrollment compared to 94% in the control group who were employed uh, two years after enrollment. Uh, and then lastly, the main findings for the SF12 mental health score two years after enrollment, we did find that in Minnesota, the uh, treatment group had a higher uh, mental health score compared to the control group. In Minnesota, it was 39.6 uh, in the treatment group compared to 37.3 in the control group. And this difference was significant at the 5% level for Minnesota alone. So just a summary of our key findings, uh, again, from the 2011 uh, report, as well as a 2014 publication. Um, the good news is that early interventions did reduce applications and receipt of SSA benefits after 12 months across both states. So uh, the main message here is that uh, policy interventions, early interventions are effective, uh, in this case, in reducing uh, dependence on uh, disability uh, programs. However, the early interventions did not have a significant impact on employment retention. In some ways, that's not surprising. Uh, both population groups were working uh, full time at the time of um, enrollment. Um, and so the fact there wasn't much change uh, is not completely a surprise. Um, and then lastly, for participants in Minnesota's treatment group, they did experience a relative improvement in mental health scores after 24 months compared to the control group. So the main um, takeaways or implications, again, early, early intervention programs uh, can be effective in reducing or uh, delaying or preventing applications and receipt of SSA disability benefits. They can benefit adults uh, with mental health conditions, um, um, again, with this focus on uh, these target populations that have severe mental illness. And lastly, the model suggests the vital role of having navigators and person-centered case managers, in addition to the availability of wraparound services uh, beyond existing basic coverage. So it's this combination of the service expansion as well as having person-centered case managers that were really important. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, we'll have questions at the end. Feel free to enter them in the chat box. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of turning it to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Joy Hamill. Thank you, Gil. Um, and let me just pull up the slides here. 
and a special thank you to, to the conference um, coordinators and planners uh, and for inviting me here to this State of the Science on Community Living and Participation. It is so very nice to see a national conference on this and I'm excited to be here. Um, what I'd like to present in, in this section is a little bit more of a summary, a whirlwind tour of three decades of participatory action research that we've been doing with disability communities specific to community living and participation. So just to situate myself, I identify as a disabled woman and an activist and a scholar, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago but I'm a part of a much broader participatory action national um, consortium that is working under this. And I also wanted to acknowledge the funding um, in large part is from NIDLER through several different projects. Um, but one of the projects I'll be talking about has also been picked up by the state of Illinois Medicaid and is available as a home and community-based service. So I'll be focusing in on interventions on community living and participation. And specifically, these are focused on people with disabilities who are trying to A, move out of nursing homes and institutions, B, live in the community long-term, and C, trying to prevent costly and unwanted future institutionalization. So landing back in the nursing home or institution. All of this research is based on the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme, Olm, uh, Supreme Court Olmstead decision. That is, it's based on the civil right to be able to live and participate in communities of choice with supports. And it's also based on providing evidence that would help to inform Medicaid with all of their significant policy changes to home and community-based services and supports um, to try and address some of those civil rights issues. All of the projects are especially focused on people who experience disparities and inequitable access to these civil rights. So to a large extent, the majority of people were living in poverty and qualified for Medicaid, home and community-based services, so public assistance. Um, a significant proportion also represented people who identify as African-American or Black, Latinx, and from other social groups. And the population was definitely a cross disability group because no matter what your disability or even if you don't have a disability yet, um, you are at risk for landing up in a public nursing home. I'm gonna share just three briefly, three programs that share a lot of elements related to community living and participation. The first program is the Stepping Stones program. This was affectionately called by the disability rights community, the Escape the Nursing Home Project. Um, it was uh, designed to be able to support people with diverse disabilities to be able to move out of public Medicaid nursing homes and or institutions to the community. And we were able to do a randomized control trial with a grant um, of this program with 140 people. And then based on that evidence, it was picked up by Illinois Medicaid and it's now been delivered to over 800 people in Illinois. The second project, which was featured in the article that was highlighted in the Systematic Lit Review, was specifically applying the same kind of program, but with people with IDD um, and their social support systems. Um, and that was also tested in a randomized control trial with 75 people and was picked up by um, several community organizations and has been offered to 400 people. And then the last project is was specific to people with stroke. Um, and it focused with people who were right after a stroke with acute care or rehabilitation who were trying to return home, who were at high risk for landing up in a nursing home or went into it even for a short period of time and wanted to get back to community living and participation. And we were able to also do a randomized control trial with them with 140 people um, in two states. So what do these three share and why am I going across them? Well, first of all, they all were based on participatory action research approach that involved the community as full partners in all aspect of this community living research. So they were involved in defining their needs, designing and delivering the interventions and acting on the findings. Across all the studies, it also used a rigorous qualitative, quantitative, and action research methods because both myself and disability right community really strongly believe that you need a combination of these if you're going to try to actually affect policy and systems change. 
So what did this look like? Well, prior to the intervention, we did a lot of action research with the community to get them on board and to get them involved. We did community action teams, um, which uh, included representatives from um, all the different communities involved in that social issue. And they helped us throughout. They commented on everything, they reviewed and evaluated everything. We also did a series of appreciative inquiry focus groups, which is an action research spin on focus groups. And it lets you work with a group to identify the issues that they're facing related to community living, and then to dream about what would you like this program to look like, and then to take action and actually make that new program. We did participatory community assessments and consumer directed goal setting. And then finally, we used a set of validated outcome instruments so we could have quantitative evidence to show the impact of these different programs. And just to mention these, because they might be of interest to you. The Community Participation Indicators Assessment, or the CPI, um, was uh, done by the RTC on rehabilitation outcomes, also um, involved a lot of action research with people with disabilities, and it gives you a nice tool for measuring outcomes across community living, community participation, social participation, and work and economic participation. Another tool we developed was the Community Participation Self-Efficacy Assessment, which is a short and sweet assessment of people's self-efficacy or level of confidence in being able to manage community living and community participation. And we use that before and after interventions. And then the third tool is from CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Their quality of life survey was based on um, a whole a number of participatory action research projects with the IDD community and is a really nice instrument for looking at choice and control related to community living and participation. And we use that in all the studies as well. During the intervention testing, we also did some action research in that the community helped us to design the interventions, to co-deliver those interventions and to test them. Um, just like you heard at the beginning of this, um, one of the theory bases that the disability rights community chose to guide us is the social model of disability. And I supplemented that with the um, uh, social determinants of health and social, social ecological theory bases that really strongly point to what's happening in the environment and how is it affecting people's choice and control and ability and rights in that community living and participation. So all of our uh, interventions were also co-facilitated by community members. We um, landed up doing a whole pool of community peer mentors who went through research training with us, um, went through IRB training and became a part of our paid research teams and helped to co-deliver all the interventions. And the interventions also included a combination of individual guided discovery, which is individual goal setting and problem solving and practicing in between the sessions in your actual context where you're trying to work on community living. But this was also coupled with group social learning, which means we brought together small um, groups of people, say anywhere from five to 10, um, all people who were working on community living and in the same social situation as each other. And they work to support each other, to problem solve together, um, and also with that peer mentor who was facilitating it, who had been through the same experience as them and who could show them the ropes. So a lot of what our programming is, is on problem solving, confidence building, and learning how to manage that environment. And just as an example of one of these, um, this is a graphic that shows the Stepping Stones program, which was the one that was working with a diverse group of people to get out of public nursing homes and institutions and into the community. Uh, and it shows that um, we did the program over 10 sessions, uh, two hour sessions often offered once a week, and they were done in community settings, usually centers for independent living, sometimes at the university. Um, when COVID hit though, we moved these um, recently onto Zoom. And so we've been delivering them online. And it's a combination of content that people are problem solving through. We always start with a really strong introduction to who is the disability rights community, who are they um, as a community um, and, and as a collective, but also what are the rights they've been fighting for, and then they teach 
civil rights to the participants and talk through what are your rights related to community living and participation? How do you advocate for them? And then we go into a whole series of actual action planning where they um, set goals related to affordable and accessible and integrated housing management, transportation management, living on a very limited income, healthcare and emergency response or risk management in the community, and then actually having fun and getting out into the community, participating, even if it's for free and you don't have a lot of money, we do a lot of strategizing on that. And then finally, we have um, a, a set of modules on social support and social networking, because we know social isolation is such a big issue for people transitioning out of nursing homes into the community. And so it's not just in-person social support, but we had a, a heavy component of actually taking them onto technology and taking them online into emails, internet, social media, so they could develop a really strong social support network online as well. What did we find across this whole set of community living and participation research? Um, well, because we were using the same tools to develop, to measure outcomes, we can see um, the outcomes across. And what we found is that we did have significant findings for the group that was in the, receiving the intervention versus the control wait list, who eventually got the intervention, um, but was waiting for a while before they got it. And the people in the intervention groups reported improved choice and control related to community living and participation, improved individual goal attainment. So those individual goals that they set up for themselves, they were much more likely to attain them. They also showed improved uh, community living engagement and satisfaction as measured by the CPI. So being able to do what you want when you want to or need to. And then also they reported something um, that we call community enfranchisement. And that's as measured in the CPI. And what that means is the individuals were more likely to say that they felt like they had equitable access to opportunities and resources, more choice and control, that they actually felt that they were members of the community and had a voice had freedom to do things and respect and dignity in that community. And I think this enfranchisement one is one of the most interesting ones to look at as outcomes for community living and participation. Once we did the interventions, then of course we kept on with the action research and our next phase was moving to action. So all of our findings and outcomes have been summarized in multiple different alternative and accessible formats and shared back with the community. We always sponsor ongoing community town halls about every three to four months. And we're just about ready to have one. We've been doing this now for three decades of community town halls, which have since moved online since COVID, but that has not prevented um, a lot more people from even participating. These are open public forums where it, it gives us a chance to share back the findings from our research, but we can also highlight participants' lived testimonies um, about the lived experience. And we invite policymakers, funders, politicians, key folk to sit in on the town halls and listen to what the disability community is telling them and then respond to questions from the disability community in a public format. So they're designed to try to get action happening and going. So where are we headed now in terms of um, uh, future community living and participation? Well, first of all, we are now pursuing um, several large scale intervention tests. So we already have been able to do randomized control trials, which provide some nice evidence for us on, on all of these interventions. But now we wanna take them into much larger numbers, much larger replication. And so that's what we're pursuing right now. Um, we're also working on a number of long-term systems and policy changes with the disability rights community. Right now is an excellent time in this administration. There are a number of, of very large policy kinds of implications happening related to home and community-based practices and services and supports that could very well change access and improve access. And then the third thing that we're doing is we are part of a national uh, consortium called the ADA Park, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act 
Participation Action Research Consortium. Um, and this is a national group. Um, it's been funded by NIDLR as two center grants for the past 10 years. Um, and it's a national group of all the ADA centers and um, many, many different disability community organizations and centers for independent living networks that all are trying to look at the question. So 30 years post the Americans with Disabilities Act now going on 31, are people with disabilities getting equitable access to community living and community participation opportunities? So in this one, we're doing large scale population health disparities research. And I encourage you to visit our website at adapark.org, park with the C versus the K. And you can see there um, that it's a forum for you to be able to look at disparities um, at the national level, the state level, and down to city and local levels. And so with that, I want to wrap up and thank you um, for listening in on this. And also a very big thank you to all the communities of learning and to all the different people with disabilities who have been involved in this research, who hold us accountable and support each other and take action to make that change happen. Um, if you would like any information on the assessments or the references, the articles that we've uh, had or the actual content for the curriculum, please feel free to email me at hamel at uic.edu and I'd be happy to send that your way. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing then and pass the ball on to Lily. Thanks, Joy. Um, and everyone for being here. I'm just going to bring up my slides. Give me one second. All right. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, uh, Catherine for that really wonderful introduction and um, everyone for coming and attending. Uh, today I am going to be talking about one project that is part of the larger Pickle project, um, promoting interventions for community living, um, the RTC that Catherine mentioned. Um, it's about the home usability program and specifically the effects of a consumer driven home modification program on community participation for people with mobility disabilities. Um, next week, I'll be talking a little bit more about home usability and a qualitative study component that we did um, uh, along with this. So come again next week to kind of hear follow up um, to this. So. Um, on the slide is, is the title and then there's a little logo here of a red and uh, yellow house that's kind of the uh, cartoon. Um, this is the logo for the home usability program. I'm still very proud of it because I created it sort of myself with some Internet tools. <laughs> anyway, really quick. So here's some background again. This is part of the RTC pickle. This was efficacy study one. Um, so it happened a couple years ago. Uh, it's funded through Nidler. I don't need to read all of this because Catherine already talked about that as that grant number and, you know, don't assume endorsement by the federal government. Um, this project, specifically the Home Usability Program, is a continuation of a previous pilot study with 30 consumers across um, three centers for independent living um, that uh, lasted from about 2013 to 2017. Great. So um, our main question for this uh, intervention is, does participation in a consumer-directed home usability intervention increase community participation for um, consumers with mobility disabilities? I'm fiddling here with my screen stuff to make it so this study was conducted um, across two centers for independent living. Oh, and I, yeah, I just got the chat that there's some background noise. Um, please let me know if that gets worse and I can try to find my headset. I think my computer is running hot. I believe that's what it is. Please let me know if it gets too loud. Um, so this uh, study was conducted, like I said, across two centers for independent living from 2017 to 2019, uh, one in Missoula, Montana, and another in Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas. We had 195 consumers participate across both centers. 
um, and then 81 um, completed the home usability intervention. Um, the remaining uh, folks were in um, were either in the control or declined the intervention or withdrew from the study. And we uh, did a it was a random control trial design to test the efficacy of this program. Um, we collected measures at three periods, pre-intervention, post-intervention, and then follow-up three months post-intervention. Uh, for the control group, this was done, um, there was an initial pre-survey, and then we collected a post-survey three months later, and then the following three months later, a follow-up. Um, we have continued this project as a component of the current uh, Pickle Efficacy Study 2 project, but changed the design a little bit um, to to follow something similar to what Joy was talking about uh, with a kind of waitlist control where we are offering the opportunity to engage in the intervention to every participant. Um, and that was some feedback we got from our uh, CL partners about wanting to be able to provide this um, intervention to everyone and it definitely raised some ethical concerns around randomized control trials within this kind of research. So we can talk about more of that later in a question. Um, our main measure was the brief community engagement questionnaire, um, which is a really, it's a pretty, it's a brief questionnaire um, that looks at participation uh, in the community, basically split into two categories, trips, which we kind of call non-discretionary trips. So like things you generally have to go out for think necessary items like groceries, um, doctor's visits, those kinds of things. And then we have social and recreational activities around socializing with friends, going to the movies, going to parks and doing outdoor recreation and then work and volunteering activities. And that question is asked for people to provide a number of how much they engaged in those different types of activities over the last seven days. Obviously, so this project was pre-COVID and this measure definitely is a little more challenging <laughs> post-COVID because people are going out into the community. And so I think really, we've really had to shift and start thinking about uh, what does community participation mean um, now to folks as the community has become less of a safe space for many people? So I'll just give a quick overview of some of the consumer demographics. Um, and then the next slide is going to be housing characteristics of the participants in this program. 70% uh, of our participants were white. 21% uh, were Black, and the remaining were other uh, racial categories, racial and ethnic categories. We had 70% of consumers made less than, making less than $20,000 a year, so a vast majority of our uh, population living at or near poverty. 80% um, of individuals are unemployed, 63% or female and the average age was 54 years old. Uh, there's a graph also, a bar chart on this slide, um, looking at uh, co-occurring disabilities. So while our project was focused on people experiencing mobility disability, um, of course, working with consumers and working with people who live at intersections of all sorts of identities, as Joy also mentioned, um, people experience multiple disabilities. So um, by far the most common, um, Co-occurring disability was an independent living disability at 57%, 48% also reporting self-care disability, 43 reporting cognitive disability, 14 with vision, um, and 10 with hearing. Um, and these are all people can report across multiple categories, and these are the questions based in the ACS kind of six question set of disability. And if people have questions about that, we can share resources about that a little later. We also had folks living in a variety of different um, housing uh, situations. So uh, we had most folks uh, in terms of housing tenure, most folks were renters, 67%, 27% were owners and 6% were other. And other would be maybe living rent-free with family or um, something like that. I also have two bar charts. Oh, I don't know where my, oh, I don't know why my things aren't showing up, but anyway, one, I think I can remember and just tell you all. Uh, one of these pie charts here is housing type, where we are looking at um, the types of housing. So single family home with 42% of folks in single family home, and then 41% in apartments with four or more units. So those are the vast majority again of where folks were living. 8% um, were in other, which is mostly manufactured housing. And then townhomes or condos, that's like uh, was the 9%. 
The other pie chart is um, housing age, and I'm not entirely sure where all of my, the rest of my graph went. So I apologize for that. Um, but most folks, oh man, here, I'm gonna have to. You would, here, I think you guys, hopefully everyone can still see it. And all. Weird. Um, anyway, the second pie chart is housing age. Um, uh, most homes that folks were living in were built between 1950 and 1990. Um, that's 35% um, of the share. And then we had 15% uh, built before 1950, 27% built since 1991, and then the remainder of folks that didn't really know when their, when their house was built. Ooh, I'll try to hurry up here and try to make this big again. Hopefully nothing else disappears. So a quick overview of the intervention procedures. Um, this intervention, as I mentioned, was part of a previous project uh, and was developed with a team of five CILs from five different centers for independent living as part of that previous funding. Uh, and then consumers worked really closely with CIL staff to work through the intervention online or with um, a printed manual. So we have a website here, screenshot to the right, the home usability program has a little welcome landing page where consumers could go through the content on their own together with uh, a CIL staff kind of however worked best. Um, our CIL staff were also um, part of the research team. So they also went through the IRB training and were, were involved in some of the data work, you know, super involved in data collection and some analysis. Um, as consumers completed the program, they would kind of go through a set process by taking a quick home usability quiz to identify issues that they might have within their home. Um, a home usability self-assessment, which was specifically we used an AARP home fit guide. Um, we would include uh, resources, um, a, a home usability plan where individuals would identify both the social and financial resources that they may have available to them for um, uh, making a home, a modification in their home, um, and then included a home visit by CIL, CIL staff when feasible. So really quick, I want to, uh, I realize I'm missing some important information here about home usability that we will get to next week, I promise. Um, but really quick, home usability is, is slightly different from home accessibility in the sense that home usability is, um, it's not necessarily about meeting codes or standards um, for universal access in that sense. It's really about what an individual needs um, for themselves in order to get the most out of their home, in order to facilitate their lives in order to improve quality of life in order to facilitate access to the community. So we had folks who worked um, on a variety of different home usability programs. And that meant that we kind of had to classify what different types of program or uh, uh, home usability projects people were working on. Um, and so here is some project classification. There's a bar chart that shows the range from um, uh, that shows the types and the areas in which people chose to work for a home usability program. And then we have some examples of what those are. So bathing and grooming, like grab bars, shower chairs, uh, cleaning, we had people purchasing robot vacuums, uh, long handled dusters, storage, things like that. Um, mobility devices, such as canes and walkers, just general safety, you know, fire extinguishers, uh, medical alert devices, uh, entrancing around the front entrance, getting threshold ramps, video doorbells and hand railings, um, cooking, like adaptive cooking equipment, new mattresses to sleeping. We had a couple folks who moved to an entirely new accessible space because their current home was inaccessible. Um, and then dressing, uh, furniture, and assistive equipment. And by far the most um, selected uh, room and areas to work on were around bathing and grooming at about 25%. We had about 21 folks work on those areas followed um, uh, by cleaning and mobility uh, with about 15 individuals and about 20% of participants uh, choosing to work in those areas. So it really looks different than maybe your traditional home modification program. These are much smaller. Participants also had access to about $350 in grant funding to help cover the cost of this. And $350 doesn't get you very far in terms of a home modification, but it can get you far 
in terms of thinking about things that you need in order to use your home. Um, and it's not intended at all to replace um, a larger home modifications that may be needed. Um, but often those programs take a very long time. Uh, it takes a long time to do a bathroom remodel, especially if you're trying to piece together funding. And so this is almost a, a like a stopgap measure to uh, improve safety and comfort and access within the home uh, right now. So our analysis, we did linear regression analysis to compare within person change and outcome scores of participants in the treatment group to within person change among participants in the control. Um, we controlled for self-reported health status and then month to control for seasonality. Um, and what we found was that consumer-directed home usability changes did positively impact participation in social and recreational activities. It did not impact trips or employment. So it, it, in one way we think about it is folks were still finding a way to get out to those discretionary things, but the, the things are the non-discretionary things like grocery store, but this did seem to make an impact on those social and recreational activities. Um, we saw that intervention participants reported a 39.5% increase in those social recreation activities immediately following the intervention, um, but their scores returned to baseline um, six months post the intervention. Uh, bathroom safety and sleeping changes also seemed to have the greatest impact we saw for folks. Um, it's important to know that the Sample sizes for some of these are a little small, um, but it seems like uh, heading in the right direction that bathing, safety, sleeping, those are areas that um, really matter um, and matter for community participation and for your ability to get out and do the things that you want. And um, it feels pretty obvious when you think about that, that you wanna be well rested, you wanna feel safe and you wanna feel you know, clean and presentable to go socialize out in the world and, and be um, amongst amongst your friends and, and others. So a little bit of a discussion about this. Um, again, I have the home usability logo up there in the corner in the top right. Uh, we have a couple things. There's both policy imp implications and then a little bit of a discussion on the impact of the pandemic. We might be able to get into that a little bit more um, later in this, uh, in this whole webinar, maybe um, the third week, I think they might go into that a little bit more. But, Really, the policy implication is that simple consumer-led home usability programs can make a difference and matter for community participation. Um, a lot of home modification programs, of course, um, are, are big, right? Because a lot of home modification needs are, are big. Um, but there is a need for addressing some of these smaller issues. And it doesn't necessarily uh, need to include a lot of um, professionals or a lot of expensive assessments or, you know, this was a simple design staff, CIL staff led um, program where it was really focusing on the consumer choice and listening to the person and trusting when you say you need something, that's probably what you need. Um, and not questioning individuals in the in the needs that they have um, for uh, for their home. And Kelsey, I see that and I am just wrapping up. I think this is my last slide. So um, really checking your assumptions at the door about um, what a person may need to use their home um, and trust that, uh, that they know what's best for them, right? Core component of um, disability rights and independent living. Um, there were some really significant impacts, of course, uh, with the pandemic, however. So this project that I'm reporting on here was all pre-pandemic, um, but we were implementing phase two, right? right when everything shut down. Um, so of course, we had to make some pretty significant changes to our intervention protocol and implementation. You know, we didn't, we had to stop home visits and limit in-person contact. Um, we did some Zoom and over the phone assessments. Um, consumers, also measuring community participation in the midst of a pandemic where really severely limiting community participation is challenging. Um, and talking to our CIL staff, we really heard that folks are, are kind of experiencing two things, increased isolation, but also some increased community connection and participation, but remotely through technology. They're also seeing decreased opportunities in the community as the community has been more shut down and things they might used to have liked to do are no longer available, even if they do feel comfortable going out. Um, and really what we learned is that home usability is more important than ever. 
from the pandemic, people were reporting loss of personal care either through, um, you know, AIDS not showing up or feeling really un unsafe with having AIDS. And that meant they were forced to doing things in their home that they hadn't done before. And finding safe, usable ways to do that is incredibly important. Um, we also really uh, learned about the importance of staying active in the home and, um, and, and participating in things like Zoom fitness classes, which one of our centers has been really um, awesome uh, about implementing and, and, and stuff like that. So I think, oh yeah, that was it. Um, I should probably put my contact information up or something, but I will, I can maybe share it out in the chat. I think, um, and we'll put that out there for like questions or something like that. So thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Jean and I will turn off my video. Thank you, Lily, and thank you everyone for being here today and staying on. Um, I'll see if I can't catch us up just a little bit here so we have time for questions. Um, Kelsey is going to display my slides for me. My presentation is gonna take a step back from looking at interventions to looking at factors that actually influence participation for people with mobility disabilities. And I'm focusing on mobility disabilities because that is what the Pickle Project um, has focused on over the last five years. So um, I'd like to acknowledge my two co-authors, Noel Kurth and Kelsey Goddard, who both work with me at the University of Kansas and who are also both on this call and can help answer questions if you have them. So we've, we've heard about the importance of um, community participation and social connectedness with regard to health. Um, and I think improving participation and connectedness is very much a public health issue. And I think we've seen that so much, it's been so evident with the pandemic and um, social isolation and social distancing and, and people really experiencing adverse mental and physical health outcomes as a result of that isolation. Uh, people with physical disabilities encounter numerous barriers to participation and connectedness, not just during a pandemic. These include inaccessible environments, health issues, transportation barriers, and limited financial resources. So understanding specific barriers or factors related to decreased participation and connectedness can help inform future interventions and supports. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. Next slide. We used primary data from the National Survey on Health and Disability, which Catherine mentioned early on, or the NSHD. Um, we had two aims with this study. First, we wanted to better understand participation and connectedness for people with mobility disabilities compared to other disability groups. And then we wanted to identify specific factors related to levels of participation and connectedness within that group of people with mobility disabilities. The sample for this study is working age adults with disabilities ages 18 to 64, total sample size of 2,156 survey respondents. We used wave two of the NSHD, which was fielded from October of 2019 to January of 2020, which so it's just before the pandemic hit and probably would have changed a lot of responses. Next slide, please. We focused on three measures for this study. The first was social isolation. And the question was, I feel that I'm isolated from other people in my community, which was rated on a scale of one to five with one not at all feeling isolated and five feeling very much isolated. We asked about satisfaction with social activities with the question, I am satisfied with my current level of social activity. Again, one, not at all satisfied and five, very much satisfied. Both of those questions came from the patient reported outcomes measurement information system, which was funded by NIH. And then we also used the loneliness scale from Hughes et al, 2004. That has three questions. How often do you feel you lack companionship? How often do you feel left out? And how often do you feel isolated from others? Each of those questions is answered on a scale of one to three for a total score of three to nine with nine indicating the greatest measure of loneliness. Uh, next slide, please. This rather <laughs> busy um, table compares our physical mo or our mobility disability group in the second column to our um, all other disabilities group in the third column. Um, the physical mobility disability group had 621 respondents and the other disabilities group had 1,535 respondents. And we compared the two populations to see how they were similar and different. The mobility disability group was significantly older with an average age of 48 years, uh, significantly less likely to be non-white. Um, the, the mobility group was also uh, significantly more likely to live in a rural area, significantly less likely to be employed, and significantly more likely to smoke or use tobacco. 
So uh, a little bit different demographically. Um, but when we looked at measures of community participation and social connectedness, first we wanted to see if um, access to transportation was a factor because especially because the mobility disability group was more rural and we found that it wasn't that the percentage of people who um, have reliable transportation was similar across the two groups and of the three measures of um, isolation and connectedness the only one that was different was um, on feeling socially isolated and for that measure people with mobility disabilities were actually less likely to feel isolated uh, next slide please so looking within the mobility disability group, we used uh, regression models to look at each of the measures. So first for social activity, being female, being young, and being in fear or poor health, all resulted in greater odds of being dissatisfied with social activity, while being employed decreased those odds. Uh, with social isolation, living in a rural area, or being in fear or poor health, resulted in greater odds of feeling very much social isolation while being employed again, decreased those odds. Next slide. And then looking at the loneliness scale with linear regression, being younger, being in fear of poor health and having income above the federal poverty level were significant predictors of greater loneliness while being employed was a significant predictor of less loneliness. And finally, although the sample sizes were small, we also looked at differences between people with mobility disabilities who reported needing but not receiving paid personal assistance and those um, who had paid personal assistance and found that those who needed it but did not have it were significantly more likely to report greater levels of loneliness and dissatisfaction with social activities compared to those who did have paid PAS. Next slide. So kind of to summarize those findings, survey respondents with mobility disabilities were more likely to live in rural areas and were more likely to be white older, unemployed, and smokers. And actually these demographics are, are um, confirmed in other literature about people with mobility disabilities. Despite their greater rurality, respondents with mobility disabilities did not report less access to reliable transportation. And they were actually less likely to report feeling socially isolated compared to those with other disabilities. And this also confirms other research by um, Repke and Ibsen that shows that people who live in rural areas um, with disabilities actually are less likely to report feeling isolated. Within the mobility disability group, employment status and health status were the two factors consistently associated with the three measures of participation and social connectedness. Um, generally having better, stat, uh, better results with being employed and worse results when um, people are poor or for health. Next slide. Um, so one of the somewhat contradictory findings was that within the mobility disability group, social isolation was greater for rural dwellers. And we wanted to explore that a little further. And we found that rural respondents within the mobility disability group disproportionately reported fair or poor health compared to the non-rural respondents. And we think that perhaps um, within that group, the fair or poor health was a driver of social isolation as much as the um, living in a rural area. And the finding that being female and being younger were significantly associated with being less satisfied with social activity is seen in other population studies of people without disabilities. Um, so this is seen um, more generally across other populations. And similarly, younger individuals in the general population are more likely to report loneliness, sadly. Um, next slide. So what are the implications of all these findings? First, medical professionals and service providers should be made aware that people with mobility disabilities and fair or poor health or who are unemployed are especially likely to need support for community participation and connection activities. Our finding that those who reported needing but not receiving paid personal assistance services um, were more likely to report loneliness and less satisfaction with social activities really underscores the importance of paid PAS for this population in terms of supporting improved physical and mental health. And I think this is a really important finding right now because we have a huge spending bill going before Congress that has a lot of allocation for um, better support of paid assistance services in the home. And I think the implications for that are huge. We really need to support that and, and make it known that it can make a huge difference in people's lives and their health. 
And finally, our findings also suggest that interventions or programs to support social connectedness might need to vary by age and gender for people with mobility disabilities. Younger individuals in particular might benefit from programs to address loneliness, and females might need supports to facilitate social activities such as respite care because we find that females are often caregivers in the home and um, could benefit from that respite care. So next slide, please. Uh, this is our contact information, mine and my co-authors. Um, please email us if you have any questions and we don't have time to address them today. Uh, also is the citation for this paper, which is in that special online supplement to display in health journal. Those articles should be available um, free via open access. If you have any trouble accessing any of those articles, let us know and we can get you a copy. And then I also wanna call out, if, if you're interested about in the National Survey on Health and Disability and how you as a researcher can access the data and conduct, conduct your own analyses, um, you can visit our website at ihdps.ku.edu and get more information, or you can also email one, one of us. Um, we have a, a data user group for the NSHD that meets monthly. And um, I'm pleased to announce we just got three more years of funding to support the NSHD and we'll be administering two more waves in 2022 and 2024. And we really want to collaborate with other disability researchers. Um, and Noel just put a, a link out. Um, we really wanna collaborate with other disability researchers because uh, we are focusing specifically or particularly on um, COVID-19 experiences of people with disabilities and really wanna make sure we ask the right questions and do the right analyses. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge that the National Survey on Health and Disability is part of the Collaborative on Health Reform and Independent Living or PRO project that was funded by NIDLER. And we really appreciate that funding because it's, it's allowed us to do a lot of really important work. So I will end it there and um, Kelsey can open up the floor to questions. Absolutely. So thank you to all of our presenters and all of our attendees today. Um, as Jean mentioned, we did want to open it up to any questions um, that you all may have. Um, so kind of as Catherine identified at the beginning, um, we just invite you to type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom uh, webinar panel. And then um, if you want to ask questions in another way, you can also um, raise your hand. Um, and if you are on the phone, you can press um, star nine to raise your hand and ask your question. Kelsey Gill asked a question in the chat. Um, I just answered it in the chat. <laughs> okay, I'll just quickly say um, there was another, there was a third wave of the NSHD administered this year that did include a, a COVID supplement to get kind of baseline information about people's experiences with the pandemic. And then we will be folding it again in 2022 and 2024 with a COVID supplement included. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Um, I am actively monitoring the Q&A box and um, I do not see any raised hands at this time. Um, but see, there's another do, question uh, in the chat. <laughs> Oh, oh she, maybe she sent it only to me, but um, <laughs> Catherine asked, what are some possible explanations for why people with higher incomes, less poverty reported higher loneliness ratings? Um, and I will let Gil chime in on this too, but we, we found a similar phenomenon in the DMIE study. Kansas was a DMIE state too. And we found that um, sometimes when people had more resources, they were more aware of what they weren't able to do. Um, and perhaps related to their disability. So that, that actually having a little bit more resources 
um, made them <laughs> more aware of their loneliness because even though they had the, the financial resources to get out and do something, um, they might not have had other uh, resources to be able to do that. But I, I would be happy to hear what other people think too because I don't know if that's the answer or not. Yeah, it's not clear if there's a, a, a strong explanation for the disparity in income level uh, and the uh, self-reported uh, loneliness measure. Um, part of that could be tied to what you know Jean mentioned, um, simply having uh, more availability of, of resources or access to things, uh, maybe increases your uh, expectations, uh, if you will, for the social relationships you have or the quality of those relationships. And with that heightened set of expectations about the quality of social interactions, you may be more likely um, to say that you're lonely. So um, this is not a great example, but if you know, you're know you in a marriage where, again, you have low income and you're it's not a great marriage, but you're forced to be in it for financial reasons, you may not say that you're lonely, but with some additional income, uh, your spouse might say, well, you know, the income's not enough. It's not doing it for me. Um, do I really want to be in this relationship? Um, and I'm not speaking from personal experience, but um, anyway, the expectations regarding the quality of a relationship or interaction may change uh, based on income level. Um, but I don't think there's a clear, one clear explanation that can uh, kind of explain what's going on. It's going to uh, vary uh, in different states. Uh, and different uh, expectations uh, regarding the quality of relationships. I don't know if any other panelists wanted to weigh in on this question. I'll jump in with this too. I think, Jean, your, your, your interpretation of it is really interesting, right? Um, and let me give you an example from our own research. Um, and again, this is with people who are living in poverty, right? Um, but we asked them about social participation and satisfaction and then also social isolation. Um, and we find that before they have an empowering intervention with the disability community, um, they rate it as a 10 out of 10, <laughs> right? You know, kind of thing. And then after the disability rights community gets in with them and starts to talk about you have a right to all of this and, you know, that some of them will even say, we got forced into a nursing home scenario because they said I'd have more social participation. And they said, well, that that did. I have more people. But then we asked them, are they people you really want to be with <laughs> you know, and want to be participating with? And you have a right to choose who you socially participate with. Um, they completely adjusted their score after it. And they actually said to us, and this is that pre-post pre test thing on anything related to satisfaction, right? That's always troubling to me, um, is, is that they said, if I could go backwards and change my initial score, I would change it to a one now that I know, right? You know, that I was really dissatisfied, right? You know, kind of thing. Um, and, and I would say now I'm, 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 I'm much more satisfied or I'm much more angry um, now is the other thing. Um, that we've seen too. So their satisfaction scores actually go down for about three months at least, um, which the funders never like to see. But then they go up after that because it's like, a, it's, it's a, I just found out my rights were completely violated and I'm looking out my window of my apartment and I'm seeing all these social relationships happening, you know, kind of thing. And now I'm angry, right? That that was taken away from me and I'm very dissatisfied. So if you just measure it right at the end of an intervention, you might actually see lower satisfaction or, you know, kind of like, you know, more um, anger at it. But then later people start to talk about, okay, now I'm getting, it now I'm working on it now I've got the disability community connections and that's changed my social isolation it's offered me something on social participation too of choice with that community um, you know so I think it's just a really interesting one and I think it has a lot to do with challenges to how we measure sometimes when we think that simply by asking somebody to report um, to go backwards and change their score, we say that's wrong from a research presentation, but what I'm hearing from participants is I'm now much more aware and I would actually really like to change my score. Can I? You know, and we're like, well, no, you know, like, so it's, 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 it's a research issue, right? It's a challenge, right? That we should probably take both. We should probably 
you know, do current and um, how have you changed, but also give people a chance to go back to their original score and talk it through after an intervention. I would, I would be curious on the home, you know, usability one too, if you wouldn't see that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is, this is Lily. We've heard the same, some really similar things about just like, I didn't realize how, you know, crappy my was, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or how like I was doing this this one way and it was just the way I did it, but it was not good. Like it 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 was took a ton of energy and I didn't really realize that before. And we've definitely and that's why we have a qualitative. So next week everyone should come to and we'll dig into a little bit more of that. It's not exactly about the intervention, but shows the complicated interactions that are always happening here. And I think Joy that this example is why it's also a really important reason for doing this participatory research and taking that lens and saying it's not just about it's not just about pre-post or if it is like it's more complicated than this and we need people's voices involved in the process in order to illustrate that you can't just answer a question and think that that's meaningful because of the environment because the context in which they're in changes everything all the time so that's really cool interesting Um, someone asked about links. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we do want to invite everyone on the call to definitely attend um, our upcoming um, state of the science webinars. Um, let's see, I had to get out of some. Um, I can. The I can. PowerPoint I was to open. <laughs> Thanks, Drew, I'm pulling them up. <laughs> but yes, we definitely want um, folks to register for upcoming um, presentations. And it sounds like Drew might be helping too to get some links in there. Yes, thank you, yes. Drew. There's um, the register for the second one and let me put the third one in there as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. We will, I don't think we everyone is seeing those, those in the chat. You're, you're only sharing with the panelists, not everyone. So I don't know. Oh, oh, right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me do that again. <laughs> oh, we're doing it. Okay. And here is the uh, third one. So many buttons. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, those links in the chat now uh, for folks that want to register for upcoming um, State of Science conference webinars. We definitely invite you to do that. Um, yeah, and again, thank you to all of our attendees uh, for coming on today. Thank you to all of our wonderful presenters. Um, I got a lot of out of this presentation and um, I think this is a fabulous kickoff to the start of this conference series. So. Wonderful, and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.